The Civil War in France by Karl Marx. This is the introduction. Written by Karl Marx as an address to the General Council of the International with the aim of distributing to workers of all countries a clear understanding of the character and worldwide significance of the heroic struggle of the communards and their historical experience to learn from. The book was widely circulated by 1872. It was translated into several languages and published throughout Europe and the United States. The first address was delivered on July 23, 1870, five days after the beginning of the Franco-Prussian War. The second address, delivered on September 9, 1870, gave a historical overview of the events a week after the army of Bonaparte was defeated. The third address, delivered on May 30, 1871, two days after the defeat of the Paris Commune, detailed the significance and the underlining causes of the first working or the first workers' government ever created. Publication information. The Civil War in France was originally published by Marx as only the third address, here comprising chapters three through six, separated into four chapters. In 1891, on the 20th anniversary of the Paris Commune, Engels put together a new collection of the work. Engels decided to include the first two addresses that Marx made to the International, which are chapters one and two in this way providing additional historical background to the Civil War. Marx's account of the Franco-Prussian War, July to September 1870. In this publication, basic titles have been provided for each chapter in brackets to give the unfamiliar reader a basic guide to the historical events each chapter discusses. Also, Engels' 1891 introduction has been separated into two parts, an introduction below and a postscript. So, um, this is 1891 introduction by Frederick Engels on the 20th anniversary, anniversary of the Paris Commune. Historical background and overview of the Civil War. Thanks to the economic and political development of France since the French Revolution of 1789, for 50 years, the position of Paris has been such that no revolutions could break out there without assuming a proletarian character. That is to say, the proletariat, which had bought victory with its blood, would advance its own demands after victory. These demands were more or less unclear and even confused, corresponding to the state of evolution reached by the workers of Paris at the particular period. But in the last resort, they all amounted to the abolition of the class antagonism between capitalists and workers. It is true that no one knew how this was to be brought about, but the demand itself, however indefinite it still was in its formulation, contained a threat to the existing order of society. The workers who put it forward were still armed. Therefore, the disarming of the workers was the first commandment for the bourgeois at the helm of the state. Hence, after every revolution won by the workers, a new struggle ending with the defeat of the workers. This happened for the first time in 1848. The liberal bourgeoisie at the parliamentary opposition held banquets for securing reform of the franchise, which was to ensure supremacy for their party. Forced more and more in their struggle with the government to appeal to the people, they had to allow the radical and republican strata of the bourgeoisie and petty bourgeoisie gradually to take the lead, but behind these stood the revolutionary workers, and since 1830, these had acquired far more political independence than the bourgeoisie, and even the republicans suspected. At the moment of the crisis between the government and the opposition, the workers opened battle on the streets. King Louis Philippe vanished and with him the franchise reform and in its place arose the republic and indeed one which the victorious workers themselves designated as a social republic no one however was clear as to what this social republic was to imply not even the workers themselves but they now had arms in their hands and were a power in the state therefore as soon as the bourgeois republicans in control felt something like firm ground 
under their feet, their first aim was to disarm the workers. This took place by driving them into the insurrection of June 1848 by direct breach of faith, by open defiance and the attempt to banish the unemployed to a distant province. The government had taken care to have an overwhelming superiority of force. After five days heroic struggle, the workers were defeated and then followed a bloodbath of the defenseless prisoners, the likes of which has not been seen since the days of the civil wars which ushered in the downfall of the Roman Republic. It was the first time that the bourgeoisie showed to what insane cruelties of revenge it will be goaded the moment the proletariat dares to take its stand against them as a separate class, with its own interests and demands. And yet, 1848 was only child's play compared with their frenzy in 1871. Punishment followed hard at heel. If the proletariat was not yet able to rule France, the bourgeoisie could no longer do so. At least not at that period, when the greater part of it was still monarchically inclined and it was divided into three dynastic parties, Legitimists, Orleanists, and Bonapartists, and a fourth Republican party. Its internal dissensions allowed the adventurer Louis Bonaparte to take possession of all the commanding points, army, police, administrative machinery, and on December 2nd, 1851, to explode the last stronghold of the bourgeoisie, the National Assembly. The Second Empire opened the exploitation of France by a gang of political and financial adventurers, but at the same time also an industrial development such as had never been possible under the narrow-minded and timorous system of Louis Philippe. With its exclusive domination by only a small section of the big bourgeoisie, Louis Bonaparte took the political power from the capitalists under the pretext of protecting them, the bourgeoisie from the workers, and on the other hand, the workers from them. But in return, his rule encouraged speculation and industrial activity, in a word, the rise and enrichment of the whole bourgeoisie to an extent hitherto unknown. To an even greater extent, it is true, corruption and mass robbery developed, clustering around the imperial court and drawing their heavy percentages from this enrichment. But the Second Empire was the appeal to the French chauvinism, the demand for the restoration of the frontiers of the First Empire, which had been lost in 1814, or at least those of the First Republic. A French Empire within the frontiers of the old monarchy, and, in fact, within the even more amputated frontiers of 1815. Such, such a thing was impossible for any long duration of time. Hence the necessity for brief wars and extension of frontiers. But no extension of frontiers was so dazzling to the imagination of the French chauvinists as the extension to the German left bank of the Rhine. One square mile on the Rhine was more to them than ten in the Alps or anywhere else. Given the Second Empire, the demand for the restoration to France of the left bank of the Rhine, either all at once or piecemeal, was merely a question of time. The time came with the Austro-Prussian War of 1866. Cheated of the anticipated territorial compensation by Bismarck and by his own overcunning, hesitating policy, there was now nothing left for Napoleon but war, which broke out in 1870 and drove him first to Sedan and then to Wilhelm Show prison. The inevitable result was the Paris Revolution of September 4, 1870. The empire collapsed like a house of cards and the republic was again proclaimed. But the enemy was standing at the gates of Paris. The armies of the empire were either hopelessly beleaguered in Metz or held captive in Germany. In this emergency, the people allowed the Paris deputies to the former legislative body to constitute themselves into a government of national defense. This was, this was the more readily conceded since for the purpose of defense, all Parisians capable of bearing arms had enrolled in the National Guard and were armed, so that now the workers constituted a great majority. But almost at once the antagonism between the almost completely bourgeois government and the armed proletariat broke into open conflict. 
On October 31st, workers' battalions stormed the town hall and captured some members of the government. Treachery, the government's direct breach of its undertakings, and the interventions of some petty bourgeois battalions set them free again. And in order not to occasion the outbreak of civil war inside a city which was already beleaguered by a foreign power, the former government was left in office. At last, on January 28, 1871, Paris, almost starving, capitulated but with honors unprecedented in the history of war. The forts were surrendered, the outer wall disarmed, the weapons of the regiments of the line and of the mobile guard were handed over, and they themselves considered prisoners of war. But the National Guard kept its weapons and guns and only entered into an armistice with the victors, who themselves did not dare enter Paris in triumph. They only dared to occupy a tiny corner of Paris, which, into the bargain, consisted partly of public parks, and even this they only occupied for a few days. <clears throat> and during this time, they, who had maintained their encirclement of Paris for 131 days, were themselves encircled by the armed workers of Paris, who kept a sharp watch that no Prussian should overstep the narrow bounds of the corner ceded to the foreign conquerors. Such was the respect which the Paris workers inspired in the army, before which all the armies of the empire had laid down their arms. And the Prussian junkers, who had come to take revenge at the very center of the revolution, were compelled to stand by respectfully and salute just precisely this armed revolution. <clears throat> During the war, the Paris workers had confined themselves to demanding the vigorous persecution or prosecution of the fight. But now when peace had come after the capitulation of Paris, now Thiers, the new head of government, was compelled to realize that the supremacy of the property classes, large landowners and capitalists, was in constant danger so long as the workers of Paris had arms in their hands. His first action was to attempt to disarm them. On March 18th, he sent troops of the line with orders to rob the National Guard of the artillery belonging to it, which had been constructed during the siege of Paris and had been paid for by public subscription. The attempt failed. Paris mobilized as one man in defense of the guns, and war between Paris and the French government sitting at Versailles was declared. On March 26, the Paris Commune was elected, and on March 28, it was proclaimed. The Central Committee of the National Guard, which up to then had carried on the government, handed in its resignation to the National Guard, after it had first decreed the abolition of the scandalous Paris morality police. On March 30th, the Commune ab abolished conscription and the standing army, and declared that the National Guard, in which all citizens capable of bearing arms were to be enrolled, was to be the sole armed force. It remitted all payments of rent for dwelling houses from October 1870 until April, the amounts already paid to be reckoned to a future rental period, and stopped all sales of articles pledged in the municipal pawn shops. On the same day, the foreigners elected to the commune were confirmed in office because the flag of the commune is the flag of the World Republic. On April 1st, it was decided that the highest salary received by any employee of the commune, and therefore also by its members themselves, might not exceed 6,000 francs. On the following day, the commune decreed the separation of the church from the state and the abolition of all state payments for religious purposes, as well as the transformation of all church property into national property. As a result of which, on April 8th, a decree excluding from the schools all re religious symbols, pictures, dogmas, prayers, in a word, all that belongs to the sphere of the individual's conscience, was ordered to be excluded from the schools, and this decree was gradually, impl uh, gradually applied. On the 5th, in reply to the shooting, day after day of the commune's fighters captured by the Versailles troops, a decree was issued for imprisonment of hostages, but it was never carried into effect. On the 6th, the guillotine was brought out by the 137th Battalion of the National Guard and publicly burnt amid great popular rejoicing. On the 12th, the commune decided that the victory column on the plate the Place Vendôme 
which had been cast from guns captured by Napoleon after the War of 1809, should be demolished as a symbol of chauvinism and incitement to national hatred. This decree was carried out on May 16th. On April 16th, the Commune ordered a statistical tabulation of factories, which had been closed down by the manufacturers, and the working out of plans for the carrying on of these factories by workers formerly employed in them, who were to be organized in cooperative societies, and also plans for the organization of these cooperatives in one great union. On the 20th, the Commune abolished night work for bakers and also the workers' registration cards, which since the Second Empire had been run as a monopoly by police nominees, exploiters of the first rank. The issuing of these registration cards was transferred to the mayors of the 20 arrondissements of Paris. On April 30th, the Commune ordered the closing of the pawn shops on the ground that they were a private exploitation of labor and were in contradiction with the right of the workers to their instruments of labor and to credit. On May 5th, it ordered the demolition of the Chapel of Atonement, which had been built in expiation of the execution of Louis the of Louis. Thus, from March 18th onwards, the class character of the Paris movement, which had previously been pushed into the background by the fight against the foreign invaders, emerged sharply and clearly. As almost without exception, workers or recognized representatives of the workers sat in the commune. Its de decision bore a decidedly proletarian character. Either they, either they decreed reforms which the Republican bourgeoisie had failed to pass solely out of cowardice, but which provided a necessary basis for the free activity of the working class, such as the realization of the principle that in relation to the state, religion is a purely private matter, or they promulgated it decrees which were in the direct interests of the working class, and to some extent cut deeply into the old order of society. In a beleaguered city, however, it was possible at most to make a start in the realization of all these measures. And from the beginning of May onwards, all their energies were taken up by the fight against the ever-growing armies assembled by the Versailles government. On April 7th, the Versailles troops had captured the scene, crossing at Neuilly, Neuilly, Neuilly on the western front of Paris. On the other hand, in an attack on the southern front of the 11th, they were repulsed with heavy losses by General Eudes. Paris was continually bombarded and, moreover, by the very po people who had stigmatized as a sacrilege the, the bombardment of the same city by the Prussians. These same people now begged the Prussian government for the hasty return of the French soldiers, taken prisoner at Sedan and Metz, in order that they might recapture Paris for them. From the beginning of May, the gradual arrival of these troops gave the Versailles forces a decided ascendancy. This already became evident when, on April 23rd, Thiers broke off the negotiations for the exchange, proposed by Commune, of the Archbishop of Paris, George Darboy, and a whole number of other priests held hostage in, in Paris. For only one man, Blanqui, who had twice been elected to the Commune, but was a prisoner in Clairvaux. And even more from the changed language of Thiers, previously procrastinating and equivocal, he now suddenly became insolent, threatening, brutal. The Versailles forces took the redoubt of moulin saquet on the southern front on May 3rd. On the 9th, Fort Issy, which had been completely reduced to ruins by gunfire, and on the 14th, Fort Von v Von v <laughs> On the Western Front, they advanced gradually, capturing the numerous villages and buildings which extended up to the city wall until they reached the main wall itself. On the 21st, thanks to treachery and the carelessness of the National Guards stationed there, they succeeded in forcing their way into the city. The Prussians, who held the northern and eastern forts, allowed the Versailles troops to advance across the land north of the city, which was forbidden ground to them under the armistice, and thus to march forward and attack on a long front, which the Parisians naturally thought covered by the armistice, and therefore held only with weak forces. 
As a result of this, only a weak resistance was put up in the western half of Paris, in the luxury city proper. It grew stronger and more tenacious the nearer the incoming troops approached the eastern half, the real working-class city. It was only after eight days fighting that the last defender of the commune were overwhelmed on the heights of Belleville and Menilmontant, and then the massacre of defenseless men, women, and children, which had been ranging all through the week on an increasing scale, reached its zenith. The breech loaders could no longer kill fast enough. The vanquished workers were shot down in hundred by Mitreus fire. Over 30,000 citizens of Paris were massacred. The Wall of the Federals, aka Wall of the Communards, at the Père Lachaise Cemetery, where the final mass murder was consummated, is still standing today, a mute but eloquent testimony to the savagery of which the ruling class is capable as soon as the working class dares to come out for its rights. Then came the mass arrests, 38,000 workers arrested, when the slaughter of them all proved to be impossible, the shooting of victims arbitrarily se selected from the prisoners' ranks, and the removal of the rest to great camps where they awaited trial by courts martial. The Prussian troops surrounding the north half of Paris had orders not to allow any fugitives to pass, but the officers often shut their eyes when the soldiers paid more ob obedience to the dictates of humanity to, than to those of the general staff, particularly honors due to the Saxon Army Corps, which behaved very humanely and let through many workers who were obviously fighters for the commune.